Um, so you remember at the end of the last class, we um, looked at the structure of these BPS equations. Uh, we found that there were, um, the single monopole had this four parameter set of solutions. Three of the parameters were sort of clear, the position of the monopole. The fourth parameter, whether you called it a parameter or not, was a little bit up to you. It was this gauge in the U1, preserved U1. Okay, that gauge transformation left phi unchanged because phi was in the preserved U1 direction. Um, and uh, if you made it time dependent, it uh, changed the, uh, the, uh, the gauge fields a bit. Okay, now, uh, uh, once you have these solutions, the procedure you follow in collective coordinate quantization is to plug these, plug the new solutions, okay, plug the new solutions into your old solutions as a function of uh, time. So, so, so we had, let's say, a mu, which was a function of the locations, uh, x0 alpha, uh, i, i is 1 to 3, and also a function of this gauge parameter, epsilon. Okay, these were exact solutions when these were constants. Similarly with phi, okay, phi was equal to phi, xi and epsilon. Now you imagine that both xi and epsilon, xi is 0, I put it, xi 0 and epsilon are made functions of t. And then you plug it into, um, uh, you plug it into the action. Now, if you remember, when we uh, worked out the uh, form of the BPS equations, what we demonstrated was that the potential energy vanished. You know, the B squared cancelled the del I X squared exactly up to this G term. You remember we wrote it as a perfect square plus g plus v times g. Okay, uh, that manipulation had no time anywhere. In it. Okay, since that manipulation works for every constant value of epsilon and every constant factor, a constant value of x zero, it also works for time dependent values of x epsilon and a time dependent values of x zero. Just time by time it cancels. Okay, so all that's left is the e squared part of the of the action, and the del zero phi squared part of the action. Right. right. So what you need to do is to take this and plug this into here. Okay, now we plug this in, in, into here. Uh, once again, we know, we know that when we put this in with epsilon and x0 i equals constant, we will get zero. And this, we've already taken the action of the underlying solution. This is the action minus action of monopole, right? Or, yeah. So we're gonna get zero. So every term here will come comes because of the time derivatives, okay? So, roughly speaking, what's going to happen is you're going to get z, uh, we call this x0 i dot squared, x0 i, x0 j, and then this x0 i is going to come from here, okay? Uh, these dots, it's going to come because of the, because ei, for, oh, let's, it's even simpler with this guy. Del zero phi has a time derivative. So the time derivative acting on the x x zero will be del i phi times x zero dot x zero i dot by the chain rule. Okay. So we use that chain rule both here and in the gauge and in the electric field. Okay. And you see that what we're going to get is something of the general structure g i j z i z m dot z n dot where z 
runs over both x0 i's as well as epsilon's. What? Epsilon was, uh, uh, this, this is not epsilon, this is g. It's a metric. We will talk about what it is in a minute. But the general structure of the action is going to be this. Well, because it's going to have two terms with time derivatives and then something mixing them up. Now that quantity that mixes, mixes them up, okay, is effectively a number. Because you do the integral over x's, over space. Right? We, we got to get the x0 was a parameter. It wasn't a function of space. We got to get x0 dot times something. x0, let's say, dot times x0 dot times something. And then in that something, you do the integral over space. Okay? You're going to get contributions both from the, from the, uh, uh, from the, from phi part as well as the gauge field part. But you know that phi and gauge field are not independent of each other. Right, B was equal to del I phi. That was the BPS equation. Okay, so largely these, these things are going to cancel each other. You go through some algebra. And when you work this out, you find the following. You find that this is equal to M x0 i dot squared by 2 as you would expect, okay, plus, let me see what you get for the other, for the gauge mark. Okay, the method is clear, right, how to go from here to here, just plug in, use chain rule, that's clear, right, okay, and um, when you get the other part, let me So I'm going to back calculate because we know that the mass of the dion is V times square root of, how does it go, uh, uh, Q squared plus G squared, okay. And uh, um, so then when we take this out, this is equal to V G square root of 1 plus Q by G squared and this will be v by g 2 q squared. And this q then uh, will be, will be, okay. So you will get here plus v times um, uh, epsilon dot squared over 2g, I believe, where epsilon dot maybe I've got the g wrong. Just, just one second. Just one second. Hmm.
I am not completely sure of this. Um, just a minute. Just one second. So this Q will be sort of like E N E. What was the mass? V times G. He doesn't give the answer. Uh, just one second. Okay, we will certainly get epsilon dot squared times v times some factor of g. Uh, v times g is the mass, right? Um, why am I writing v by 2 here? Thank you. Why did I? Yeah. No, but then I wrote this. Ah, the, 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 sorry. I meant the first order correction. Uh, we, we're interested in the correction, right? Because what we're going to do by getting the collective coordinate thing is the correction minus the monopole mass. Okay, just like here, we got this because we took p square plus m square. We take m out, so we'll get m square root of 1 plus p squared by m squared. And then that becomes like p squared by 2m, which comes from uh, 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 which comes from the action which has an m here. Okay, I'm, I'm sorry, I might be getting it wrong. I might be getting this g dependence wrong. Okay, it also depends on how, what my normalization of it. So if I work with... Uh, 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 if I work with, um, yeah, so this, wait, it should be clear. The G dependence should be clear because you see the monopole mass is like G. The, elect the mass of the electric mass is like E. Where we had VG, yeah, it should be like VG the whole thing squared plus VE the whole thing squared. Right? And G E is equal to 1 for pi. Okay? And therefore, this should be sort of like N by G, the whole thing square. Right? So what we should get is, I'll take a VG out. Then I get uh, 1 plus uh, N squared by uh, g squared. Okay, so I should get v g divided by. Um, g to the power four. Thank you. I should get this v g divided by g to the power four. That should be the answer for my my action. But uh, so now let's work with an epsilon. Uh, an epsilon which has periodicity 1. Okay, so then uh, p squared is, is n squared by 2m. So the thing outside the action should come with a... Uh, 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 g cubed by v, right. Right, this should, right, yeah, yeah, it makes dimensional sense also, right, because my epsilon is dimensionless, this therefore is dimension energy, uh, so the thing that, yeah, so g cube, with some number, I think this is probably right.
I can check this. Okay. So if we work with epsilons, if we work with epsilon such that uh, epsilon is periodicity 2 pi, okay, then uh, 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 I believe uh, this is the structure that emerges uh, when you r work out the collective coordinate quantization of the signal mono. Hmm? Of course, I've back calculated. The point is that now you quantize this action, okay, you get precisely what you would get from that BPS formula. Uh, you get the, the, uh, the motions, uh, translational motion is generated by Lorentz invariance, is what you would get from Lorentz invariance. That of course you knew had to be correct. And the uh, uh, dependence of the energy on charge is, ge is generated by the, uh, by this generalized BPS formula. You know, we have that, uh, I, I showed you that for uh, when you have a magnetic charge, your mass was greater than or equal to G times V. When you have both magnetic and electric charge, uh, a similar argument, uh, it's actually easier to do it with, with the supersymmetry, but anyway, a similar argument shows you that uh, uh, the mass is greater than or equal to square root of Vg plus Vq. This argument in the context of BPS, uh, uh, short representations of the BPS algebra, we've gone through at some point if you remember. You know, in the supersymmetry algebra, let me remind you how it went from that point of view, just to remind you how that goes. Um, in the supersymmetry algebra, we had Q and Q bar. This had an alpha, this had an alpha dot, let's say beta dot, and this had a P slash alpha beta dot. Okay, let's say that we're doing N equals some general n, let's say n equals 2, so n equals 2, okay? We could have a, uh, an algebra like this uh, with an epsilon ij, okay? But we also had q alpha, q beta, okay? Uh, q alpha, q beta uh, ij having, uh, um, this was a delta, because i delta ij. Q with Q bar, okay? And then we could, we could have epsilon ij times epsilon alpha beta times z, okay? And similarly with Q bar. Times z bar, okay? And in this language, this, uh, uh, this Z turns out to be uh, Vg plus Iev. Okay? And then if you remember, we found that the uh, mass squared was greater than or equal to mod Z squared. Okay? So mass was greater than or equal to square root of that. And, you know, that's how it comes about from supersymmetry. Okay? Excellent. So we're, we're um, uh, so we we finished our discussion of the single monopole. We finished the discussion of its collective coordinates and its quantization. And the whole point of this discussion was that it was to explain to you how, uh, even though you found a single monopole kind of solution, you automatically found a whole bunch of diom solutions. Okay, now, really speaking, really speaking, if we wanted to find Dion solutions, we should be finding new solutions to the equations of motion. Okay, we got away with doing something uh, with some cheap, cheap trick kind of stuff, right? This collective coordinate. What is the thing that allowed us to get away with that? You know, whenever you do an approximation in physics, you need a parameter. What is the parameter that allowed us to do that approximation? Well, that's sort of clear. When can you do this collective coordinate kind of thing? It's only when you can think of the new solution as a small perturbation around the old solution. But look at the mass of the new solution. The mass of the new solution is square root of g squared v squared plus e squared 
Q squared. Okay, so let's say if you have charge one and mass one, uh, charge one and electric, magnetic charge one and electric charge one, it would be square root of g squared v squared plus uh, uh, square root uh, plus uh, uh, square root uh, plus one by v squared by g squared. Now g was one over e. So the first term was square root of v by e, the whole thing square, the magnetic mass. The second term is plus v squared e squared. But e was the coupling constant of our theory. Right? That's the thing that came behind outside the Yang Mills action. So if the coupling constant was small, that second term is very small compared to the first. It's a small perturbation on the basic solution. Okay? And uh, of course. We could consider electric charges that themselves were so large. Were themselves order 1 over e or 1 over e squared or something like that. That would not, then make that second term not small. But the second thing we realize is that electric charge comes quantized. Because of this circle direction of this gauge field. Okay, So if we stick to, so there is a natural sense in which we can state, stick to charges of order 1 in this units of quantization. Sticking to those at small, weak coupling, the collective coordinate approximation is a good one. Right? Because the energy contained in the time derivatives is parametrically small compared to the energy contained in the space derivatives. So the time being a small, slow variation compared to the space is a good approximation. Is this clear? Okay? So the weak coupling approximation gives us parametric control. Uh, gives us parametric control and allows this collective coordinate quantization to be done reliably. So if we're at weak coupling, we can, which is when we should own, we should never be looking at cl classic solutions unless we're, uh, classical solutions unless we're at weak coupling. When we're at weak coupling, we can also compute these dion, these dion properties without resolving the equations. And in fact, we got something that we wouldn't have got had we resolved the equations. Had we resolved the equations, we could have only done it classically. And that classical resolving would have missed the fact that the electric charge was quantized. Because it would have been quantized in, para in units of a parameter that was effectively zero in the classical limit. Right? Because electric charge is quantized in units of E, and E goes to zero in the classical limit. E was our G squared Yang Mills that we wrote at the beginning of the last lecture. So the classical solution wouldn't have seen this quantization. Whereas when we work quantum mechanically, we see the quantization. Okay? So, though you might think we should be doing better, we should be finding another, another classical solution, it's neither necessary, nor is it actually even a very smart thing to do. Because there's an, a feature of the solution that we wanted to keep track of. Namely, that electric charge was quantized. That is visibly qu visible quantum mechanically, but not qu classically. Is this clear? Okay? Excellent. Fine. Now, the last thing we're going to discuss before we go on to looking at the n equals 4 theory by itself is about, so, so far we've dealt with the bosonic zero modes of, uh, uh, of these, uh, uh, we've dealt with, these, with, the, with the bosonic zero modes of these, of these solitons. Okay? Now you can ask, what about fermionic zero modes? In theories where there are fermions, do these solitonic, uh, these solitons have fermionic zero modes? Okay, and, and the answer is yes. Okay, so uh, let, let us examine, uh, let, us, let us understand this in a, in, 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 in a little bit of detail. Okay, um, let's suppose we start, okay. Um, Though we're going to be, though it's of interest to us only to deal with uh, fermionic zero modes in the adjoint representation, because our n equals 4 theory has fermions only in the adjoint representation. When studying n equals 2 theories, it is often convenient to, it's often interesting to study these theories with matter in the fundamental representation. In fact, the second Cyberg-Witted paper, 
the one that immediately followed the one which we spent so much time on in class. We, didn't, we haven't talked about that. We briefly mentioned it, right, when we were talking about this Witten stuff. Uh, but the second cyborg Witten paper was basically analyzing SU2 theory with one, two, three, and four fundamental flavors. Okay, so uh, uh, when studying n equals two theories, you can add hypermultiplets to your Lagrangian. And uh, so it's of some interest to study zero modes, both of fundamental matter as well as of adjoint matter. Okay. Um, so first I'm going to give you the general rule. I'm going to give you the general rule. This comes from an index theorem. And then we will see how bits of this rule we can understand in our own, from our own point of view. Okay. The rule goes this way. For every fundamental fermion, Uh, by fermion, I mean two while multiples, so one Dirac, one Dirac field. Okay, we get one complex zero mode. In the single in the single monopole background. Okay? And the second part of the rule goes, uh, it's a little bit like one and two n uh, two n for fundamentals and, uh, and uh, adjoints. The second part of the rule goes that for every adjoint uh, for me. Huh? we get uh, two complex zero modes. Uh, for, uh, uh, for every, uh, for, uh, uh, for every, um, uh, every fermion, so two while. Okay, is the statement of the rule clear? This is, I'm sorry, yes. We're just talking about SU2. Yes, this scales, right. But this is just, just SU2. Okay. Okay, right. So let's, yeah, just talk about SU2. Okay, we're going to understand aspects of this rule very soon. Okay, but... Uh, uh, first is the statement of the rule claim. Okay. Now, what does it mean that you have zero modes? It means simply this. You take the Dirac equation. You take the Dirac equation in the background of the monopole field. The Dirac equation comes with some representation of the gauge group. And you try to solve that equation. Now, that equation, of course, has infinite number of solutions. But there are special solutions which have zero energy. You ask, does the Dirac equation in the background of this monopole solution have zero energy solutions or not? And if so, how many solutions? Okay, this rule tells you how many. Moreover, all with one sense of uh, winding of the monopole, if B is positive with one convention, all the zero modes are, are chiral. In fact, the index theorem tells you that about the difference between chiral and anti-chiral zero modes. And then there's a simple argument to show that there are no anti-chiral zero modes. The index theorem tells you the number. But also, you know, in the case of the, these BPS uh, solitons, the, uh, the monopoles, the monopoles are so explicitly known that you can actually just solve the Dirac equation and find these solutions. Okay, it's not a very hard problem. Okay, now what consequence does this have? Okay, zero modes are extremely consequential. Zero modes and path integrals are consequential because they give you zero unless you have enough insertions. Zero modes in Hamiltonians are also consequential uh, because they have interesting commutation relations between them. Okay, so let's look at um, 
Uh, let's look at the, uh, first let's look at this, fu this fundamental business. Okay, let's take an aside to look at the fundamental zero mode. First question, these fundamental zero modes when they arise, what space-time quantum numbers do they carry? Now look, remember that we were looking at the SU2 theory? And the SU2 theory, uh, in the SU2 theory, the fundamentals were in the fundamental of SU2. Okay? And they're also in the half representation of rotations. So remember that there were that the problem had two apparent symmetries. There was the gauge SU2. times the SU2 of rotations. And our background was invariant only under the diagonal linear combination of these two. Okay? So all the quantum numbers of all modes can be expanded, can be organized in multiplets of this diagonal SU2, the one that leaves the background unchanged. Okay? So, this fundamental that we had, how did it transform under this gauge? It was in the two-dimensional representation of gauge. How did it transform under rotation? It was in the two-dimensional representation of rotation. Now we're looking at the diagonal combination. What does it mean? We want to know how does two, something that's in the two and the two transform under the diagonal as you do. But this is the problem of Klebsch-Gordon decomposition. Okay, this is the problem of uh, Klebsch-Gordon decomposition and therefore we know that 2 cross 2 goes into the 3 plus 1. Okay, and this one complex zero mode that appears, well it has to be in some representation of this SU2 times SU2 and since there's only one of it, it's pretty clear which representation it's in. It's in this representation. It was in the three, there would have to be three of them. Why is it in one? Well, if you know that there's only one zero mode, uh, there's no option. I haven't shown you that there's only one zero mode. But you can do that by either solving the equation or using this index theorem. Okay, turns out there's one zero mode, you can actually find it. But I'm saying if you already know that there is only one zero mode, then there's no real option. It has to be in a full representation of the preserved SU2 times SU2. So it's either in the 3 or the 1, but there's only 1, so it's clearly in the 1. Okay? Great. Let us contrast this analysis to what we're going to get from the adjoint, the problem of real interest to us. Okay? So let's also work out the adjoint on the side. When we're looking at the adjoint, the adjoint under group is in the 3, under spin is in the 2, okay? So now we have 3 cross 2, so that's spin 1 plus spin half, that gives you spin 3 halves and spin half. Huh? That's spin 3 halves and that's spin half. Okay? So when we're looking at the adjoint, the zero mode has to be in the 2. There are two zero modes. Clearly, it's in the two. Now, what is the importance of this analysis? The importance of this analysis is the following. Remember, we decided that we were going to call the uh, monopole that we constructed a scalar under SO3. It was a scalar under SO3 because it preserved this combination of rotations and gauge. So what, what we mean by physical rotations is the combination of rotations and gauge that is preserved by a monopole. Okay? And the quantum numbers that we're finding here are quantum numbers under that preserved rotation. And therefore, they're the quantum numbers of spin. And so this tells us that the zero modes for the fundamental field are spin zero. Whereas the zero modes for the adjoint field are spin half. Okay? 
This tells us what? That quant okay. So now let's do the quantization. Now when we have zero modes, of course, we know the fun the fun with the fermionic zero modes in Hamiltonian languages by quantization. Okay. So what do we get? Should the question shouldn't it be adjoint you're asking? Okay. You see. Adjoint is the representation the fermion is in. Now you take the Dirac equation with the fermion in. So the Dirac equation is the equation d slash psi is equal to 0. But this d slash is d mu plus i a mu. Okay? And a mu is in some representation. So you plug in those representation matrices and then you ask of this solution, of this equation, how many solutions are there? Okay, this solution now is no representation, it's just something. Okay, because the, you say, you, 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 might, you might ask, why don't the solutions appear in multiplets? I think that's your question. Multiplets of the gauge representation. Yes. The two is the spin. It's the fact that fermions are spin half. Lorentz, Lorentz spin. Oh, sorry, I misunderstood your question. Yeah, but let me just com complete answering what I thought was your question. I thought your question was, why isn't, why don't solutions appear in multiplets of SU2, of the SU2 gauge? And the reason for that is that the background does not preserve SU2 gauge. Right? You do an SU2 gauge rotation here. This is not a symmetry of this equation because A mu is not invariant under SU2 gauge transformations. You do the rotation, it changes a mu. This is clear? So it's not a symmetry of the equation, so it will not be symmetry of solutions. Once again, you could ask, why are, why are the solutions in representations of SU2 rotation? It's the same thing. The solution does not preserve SU2 rotations. But the solution, a mu, does preserve SU2 times SU2. So, the background solution. Therefore, this equation preserves that SU2 times SU2. Therefore, its solutions have to re appear in representations of that preserved thing. And that is what we were keeping track of. Is this clear? Yes. So, is it, is this the, is the statement for supersymmetry Yes, yes. For supersymmetry, of course, we do need adjoint because that's the super partner of the gauge field. The zero modes that come from the hypermultiplets. Yeah, I mean also for the zero modes, because... No, but the, the, the zero modes, are, yeah, so the statement as you say, uh, as you say, is that there are some zero modes that are forced by supersymmetry, and there are some that might be accidental. Okay? The zero modes that are forced by supersymmetry come from the fermionic superpartners of the gauge field. Those are necessary, and we will see in two minutes how they're related to supersymmetry. Okay? You may have additional zero modes from the fermionic superpartners of the, uh, of the, uh, uh, of the, let's say, the, the, the massive guys, the hypermultiplets. Okay? These are accidental, as can be seen by, from the fact that you can give these hypermultiplets a mass. And then these fermionic zero modes will go. So if the hypermultiplets happen to be massless, they will have zero modes. So you may have extra zero modes. Okay? But there are some you cannot do without. Those are the ones that come from the fermionic superpartners of the gauge fields, which are massless because the partners of a massless gauge boson is massless. Okay? But we'll say more about this as we, as we go along. Okay, excellent. So now let us look at the consequences of this. Let's look at the consequences of these guys, these zero modes. Okay, these fundamental zero modes. Okay, so we these fundamental zero modes were one complex zero mode. So we can break them up into two real. Okay, 
Now, these zero modes, as usual, you know, the zero mode and its complex conjugate have the, a, obey the commutation relations of a fermionic harmonic as oscillator, as usual. Okay, in, in, when you put them into real terms, they obey a two-dimensional Clifford algebra. Right, I'm saying gamma x, gamma y can be made gamma, gamma ba. Okay, but now suppose we've got not one massive, you know, one hypermultiplet giving rise to one of these, these, uh, uh, these zero modes, but nf of them. Then what we will have is 2nf of these zero modes, 2nf real zero modes, so nf complex or 2nf real zero modes. Okay, and these two NF zero modes, okay, these two NF zero modes, okay, they generate uh, the following algebra, A zero I, let's say, A I A J is equal to delta I J. The Clifford algebra in two NF dimensions. Okay, now where did two, so this, they generate Clifford algebra of SO2NF. Now where did 2NF come from? You know, we took a theory with NF hypermultiples. Where did 2NF come from? Actually, this, two, this 2NF is an, uh, is an, is an uh, accident of SU2. You see, when you have in SU2, What do you mean counting? The count, from the counting, we, we concluded that for SU2, uh, the, the number of fundamental for, uh, zero modes, there uh, is an SU2 complex. One complex, uh, or two real. Yeah, but uh, uh, now the, you added NF of them because you had NF hypermultiplet. So ah, but each hypermultiplet has its own fermion. The gauge field is SU2. Gauge field is SU2, but there's a separate matter multiple. We were talking about for, for, uh, uh, zero modes coming from fundamental fermions. Each hypermultiple carries its own fundamental fermion. Right? So there's going to be those many Dirac equations, right? One for each flavor field. So each will come with its own, with its own zero mode. So there will be two NF of them. Is this clear? And, you know, in this case, the fact that we've got 2NF is an accident of SU2. What happens is that you've got, in, in this multiplet, you've got this complex scalar. You remember what a hypermultiplet was? It was a complex scalar and a complex fermion. Now, the complex scalar in a higher, in an SUN, you, if you have NF of these, you would have, they would be invariant under SUNF symmetry. However, in the case of SU2, there is this accident which is that the fundamental is the same representation as the anti-fundamental. So phi and phi star transform the same way under gauge field, gauge representation. So instead of thinking of phi and phi star, it's better to think of in terms of real and imaginary. So instead of thinking of N, NF complex scalars, equivalently, you can think in terms of 2NF real scalars. Note, this would not be possible for SUN for n greater than 2. Because their phi and phi star cannot mix with each other. One is in one representation, the other is in another representation. But in SU2, these two are just the same representation. There you will get only enough. There you would get, instead of, right, you would get, uh, you would get, uh, yeah, uh, there, even if at the level of, uh, zero modes of the fermions, you got the whole thing. Here, these are going to, I think there you will still get the same number, you, uh, the number of zero modes. The real zero modes, you'd get two complex. I think that would always be true, I have to check. But I think you would get, oh, sorry, one complex or two real. But in that case, you would have many multiplets. The, what you would get from your fermion thing, 
from the zero, a quantization of the zero mode would be a several multiplets of your true symmetry group, which would be SUNF or UNF actually. Okay? In this case, you get just a single multiplet of your true symmetry group, which is SO2NF. Is this clear? I'm saying the Lagrangian itself, though it wasn't manifest from the way you write it, the Lagrangian itself has an SO2NF symmetry. Okay? And this comes about because you can take the fields and their complex conjugates and rotate among them. Okay? So in, in an SU2, N equals to SU2 gauge theory, you have this enhanced global symmetry. Okay? Instead of having what you might have guessed, what, what would have been if had it been an SU3 gauge group, SU3 gauge group, you would have had uh, a global symmetry which would have been uh, um, UNF. Okay? But when the, th the gauge group happens to be SU2, because of the phenomenon that the, um, uh, that the, uh, uh, that the uh, fundamental and anti-fundamental modes are actually the same dynamically at the level of the Lagrangian, you can do, do some rotation between them. You've got at the, you, at, the, uh, at the microscopic level a larger symmetry group. And so everything had to appear in representations of that symmetry group. And it does just, does enough to give you one big representation, maybe two big representations because chiral and anti-chiral. Okay? So what you get here is spinners of the global symmetry group. Okay, uh, spinners of SO2NF. Actually, you get two representations because you get chiral spinners and anti-chiral spinners. Okay, notice that in the case NF equals 4, SO2NF is SO8, and this is a famous fact in the cyber witten analysis of uh, four flavors. This is a very beautiful theory. N equals 2 coupled to four flavors happens to be conformal. It's a very beautiful theory and has SO8 um, uh, global symmetry. Because of what? Triality. Yes, triality plays an important role in. Uh, it has. Uh, if, if triality plays an important role in the S duality group. This theory also has invariance under, under S duality, like N equals 4 Yang, slightly different S duality. And there's an important shuffling of representations under that triality. Okay, it's a very beautiful theory, actually. But let's not get into that one. Okay. Okay. So this was just a little diversion to tell you about the zero modes with fundamentals. Uh, I'm telling you about that, A, because it's interesting in its own right. And B, because if you want to study uh, uh, N equals 2 theories with matter, you will need to know all this. So for SU3, we will have SU and U. You will have UNF global symmetry. Yes. Right. For any SU higher, you will have that. Yes. This enhancement happens for SU2 very generally, even in three-dimensional theories, and again plays a big, big role in many of the, um, in many of the phenomena of the theory. Okay. Excellent. So the lesson here was that when you have these monopoles, fundamental matter give you zero modes. The zero modes are space-time scalars. You make a multiplet of scalar fields. Of course, because it's supersymmetric, you won't have only scalar fields. You'll also have some fermions, but that, you don't see that from these zero modes. To see the additional other guys, you'll have to go to those zero modes. Because every theory always has adjoint zero modes. <coughs> Okay, because of the superpartners of the uh, of the gauge field, every supersymmetric. Is this clear? Okay, perfect. Um, uh, perfect. Now, um, now let us study. Okay. By the way, theories with n equals two or higher supersymmetry are the natural location to study monopoles. Why not n equals one? The reason for that is that in n equals 1 theory, uh, the gauge multiplet is the gauge field and the gauge genome. 
there's no necessary adjoint scalar in the game. But the adjoint scalar was a very integral part of the monopole solution. Okay? So having an adjoint scalar is sort of necessary for the monopole. Having an adjoint scalar with zero potential if we want BPS solutions was necessary. And then N equals one theory, N equals two and higher th theories, as we saw in our discussion of cyber. That is forced on us by supersymmetry. So very natural place for looking at these BPS monopoles is N equals two and higher theories. Not so much N equals one. Okay? Excellent. Now let's look at these theories, the, these zero modes. Okay? Well, there are two of them. If, if we're in, any, in an N equals two theory, there are two of these zero modes. Okay? Two complex spin half. Okay? And so let's look at the multiplet that they will create. This, this analysis is relevant, for instance, for the monopole of the cyborg witten theory we studied. Okay, so we could start with, um, for, so they transform in the two here. So the, the, we can think of them as creation operator in spin half, creation operator in spin minus half, and then annihilation operator in spin half, and annihilation operator in spin minus half. Right, these are the four Fermi, these are the four real fermionic zero modes of four modes when we keep track of the fact that one complex is two real. Okay. Now let us suppose that for instance our vacuum let us suppose that our, our vacuum was annihilated by um, uh, by all the annihilation operators. So then our multiplet will be generated by this, then by A dagger plus minus half on vacuum, and by A dagger half, A dagger minus half on vacuum. So our multiplet consists of two bosons and two spin half fermions, which is precisely the state content of a hypermultiplet in n equals two, uh, n equals two theory. Okay, so quantizing the monopole when you take into account its uh, fermionic zero modes gives you a full hypermultiplet, not just the monopole itself. Of course, we knew that had to be the case from supersymmetry, but we see how this works. Now, you can ask, well, we had an argument that this had to be, if you th think through our lectures on making short multiplets, we made the short multiple by exactly the same route. We looked at some, we went to the, uh, uh, you know, the, uh, the frame in which the particle was at rest. And then we looked, because it was short multiple, it was annihilated by half of the supersymmetries. Okay, total number of supersymmetries in the N equals two theory is eight. Half of the supersymmetries annihilated. The other half act like Clifford algebra. So four supersymmetries act like Clifford algebra. These are the four things. Okay. Comparing these two stories, there is a very natural guess. The natural guess is that the zero modes in the adjoint representation, at least for the adjoint that is the superpartner of the gauge field, are precisely those zero modes that are generated by supersymmetry. Okay. And what does that mean? Well, um, it's not hard to show, and I will outline the argument for you in a minute. It's not hard to show that the, that the monopole we're looking at, that the monopole we're looking at is half BPS. So that the monopole solution is annihilated by half of the supersymmetries. This is precisely as in our representation theory. Half of the supersymmetries annihilated it. Remember, the, the, that was the game when mass was equal to mod z, half of the supersymmetry is annihilated. It's not hard to show directly from the solution that this is true. I will outline that argument in a minute. And then what we got was by acting with the supersymmetries that did not annihilate it. Now from the point of view of field theory, what does this mean? 
from the point of view of field theory, it goes this way. You've got this monopole solution. Now you act on it with supersymmetries. The supersymmetries that annihilate the solution annihilate it, so you don't get anything from that. But the supersymmetries that don't annihilate the solution, when acting on the solution, give you a zero mode. A fermionic zero mode. Okay? So, these four zero modes that we see are precisely a consequence of the Goldstone theorem applied to supersymmetry. The broken supercharges generate fermionic zero modes. These are the four. So, this calculation that we did here is actually the same as the calculation we did when we were trying to make multiplets of supersymmetry. Because these zero modes are precisely those supercharges that were not and didn't annihilate our special state. You may want to think of these as the Goldstone supercharges. They are the Goldstone zero modes that come from the supercharges that don't annihilate. Just like, you know, if you have a vacuum that breaks spin rotations, you act on it with a spin, it produces a Goldstone boson. It's like exactly like that. Is this clear? Okay? So, this, that you produced a hypermultiplet in the n equals, <laughs> that we produced in a hypermultiplet in the n equals 2 theory was very nice. We can see this from the, from the point of view of zero mode, but it's actually the same as what we, what we saw when we discussed supersymmetry, representations of supersymmetry. Is this clear? So, in a way, what we get by quantizing, doing the fermionic quantization of the soliton, is a, a particular example of producing BPS representations of supersymmetry. The algebra is actually the same. It's the same thing. Okay? But it's sort of very nice to see how it works from the semi-classical point of view. Is this clear? Okay? Now, finally, let's get to the n equals 4 theory. From the n equals 4 theory, we can think of it in two ways, both of which will give us the same answer. One is that the, one is that the, the first way is that the monopole, uh, oh, um, okay, let's not. Uh, by the end of the class, I will tell you how you can see that the monopole preserves half of the supersymmetries. But uh, let, let me not break the flow now. Uh, it's just, anyway, let me not break the flow now. Okay, so uh, um, for the n equals 4 theory, we have, um, let's see, one way of thinking of it is from the point of view of counting zero modes from, uh, for wild fermions, okay? So instead of getting two complex, now we'll get four complex zero modes. We'll get two copies of what we got for the n equals two theory because from the point of view of counting zero modes, just like the word two of these wild fermions, two of these pairs of wild fermions. Remember that the n equals 4 theory is state content at four wild fermions in, in the multiplet. Double the number of fermions as in the n equals 2 theory. So we'll get double the number of zero modes. Okay, so what will the uh, multiplet look like from this point of view? Well, in addition to these a's, we also have b's, let's say. b dagger half, b dagger minus half, b half, B minus half. All of these anti commute with each other. Okay? Clearly, the total number of states is going to be 16 because we can act with each of these or not. Let's organize these states divide, uh, you know, by spin. First, we can have uh, A dagger minus half, B dagger minus half, and then there's the CPT pair of that, which is A dagger half. B dagger half on omega. Clear? Okay. And then we can have um, all the states with uh, uh, all the states. Uh, th then we can have all the states, I suppose, with spin. That's right. Well, let's, right. Um, there are the states with the spin, let's do the states with spin zero. 
Let's f finish the bosons first and then come back to the fermions. So the, uh, the bosons uh, will be spin min A dagger minus half, B dagger half on omega or A dagger half, B dagger minus half on omega or omega itself or A dagger, A dagger, B dagger, B dagger on omega. All of these guys have spin zero. Okay, have I missed um, anything? Have I missed anything? Uh, is it really true that all the remaining will have? Shouldn't I have expected to have eight here? These are not all bosons, right? I mean, you get A dagger half, B dagger half. Right? A dagger half, B dagger half, we've taken the count here. That's the gauge feature. Okay. Uh, let, let me list the remaining and then we see, right? We're getting too many fermions. I've missed a couple, right? Ah. Half, half, half. ah, that's it. A dagger, there, 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 right. A dagger half, A dagger minus half on omega and B dagger half, B dagger minus half on omega. Okay, great. Now it's as it should be. We get six scalars. As we expect, right? Six scalars, two from the gauge field. We produce a gauge field. Again, as we expect. Okay? And, and uh, then we get the fermions. Now, the fermions are those with the odd numbers of A daggers. We can have either one A dagger, okay? Or three. One and three are CPT conjugate. So you get four states with one A dagger or one B dagger. Four states with three A dagger, B dagger. So totally eight fermions. So we're pr perfectly producing the spectrum that we saw anyway in the Lagrangian of the N equals 4 theory. This is a mass deformed version of that. Okay, so perfectly producing that spectrum. Okay, six scalars, uh, four wild fermions, and one vector field. Okay? Once again, we can, uh, we can understand this from the point of view of supersymmetry. Okay? The n equals 4 theory had 16 supercharges. The soliton preserves 8 of them. Therefore, 8 supercharges break the supersymmetry. I mean, the, the, the soliton breaks 8 supercharges. Acting on the soliton with the broken supercharges produces the Fermi on zero modes. And uh, therefore, we get uh, 2 to the power 8 by 2, which is 2 to the power 4 states in the multiplet. And you see how it's organized. Okay, so um, good. Can we have solitonic solutions? Um, uh, uh, well, we have this state content because of the supersymmetry, Th this adjoint stuff. The fermion, is, the fermion zero mode counting doesn't depend on supersymmetry at all. Yes, yeah, so if I considered a monopole which preserves uh, uh, only four supercharges, not eight. But uh, you would have to find such a solution. No. That's what your, uh, your question is. Um, you see these BPS in the n equals two theory. Let's say we take the n equals two theory with just no, no matter. In the n equals 2 theory, the single monopole just does preserve half supersymmetry, right? In the multi monopoles, preserve half supersymmetry. It's the same supersymmetry. So, uh, there, the number of supercharges that's preserved is just something fixed. They are half BPS multiplets. You may wonder about some cooked up n equals 1 theory. No, at least, the, any, no, I don't think you'll find any such solutions. You see, we found all the solutions obeying the BPS equation in the one monopole sector. 
That solution just happens, does preserve. Let me explain to you why it preserves two supersymmetries from the point of view of, uh, of solutions. Okay. How do you test, how many, how do you compute how many supersymmetries of classical solution preserves? Okay. So the way you do it, it goes as follows. You act on that solution with supersymmetries. Okay. You act on the, you act on the, uh, you look at the right hand side of the supersymmetry variation equations, evaluate around that solution, and you demand that every right hand side be zero. Meaning Q, Q there? No, just Q. Okay. Oh, the variation. The variation. You take Q on fields, look at its right hand side, and demand that the right hand side be zero for every field. Now, we are only doing this classically. Classically, every time you see a fermion, that's zero. Because fermions cannot have classical expectation values. Okay? So the variations of all bosonic fields, which will be fermionic on the right hand side, are automatically zero. All you have to do is to check the variations of the fermionic fields, whose right hand sides will be bosons. You have to check whether that's zero or not. Okay? So let us look at the uh, n equals 2 multiplet. And look at the supersymmetry variation in terms of components. Um, this is very much uh, this is very much like what we did for the n equals four theory. Okay, and we get. I'm just writing down the fermionic variation. Okay. Uh, delta of the gauge genome, uh, this guy Harvey calls it psi, gives you sigma mu nu f mu nu plus d slash s plus i d slash p plus i d dot s. What the hell is all this? Let's. I'll have to see what all this is just a minute. Ah. Yeah. These P and S are the two um, the two scalar fields. Uh, basically forget P. Uh, we make complex and just forget this p and this uh, on on the case where we have only this uh, for uh, the the complex scalar field turned on effectively this is this this is the variation okay now this acting on some spinner field some spinner field some spinner field has to be zero okay these Supersymmetry here, this is just global supersymmetry, is parameterized by a constant spinner. And we, this equation has to be satisfied. Okay. But now you see, let us, uh, in, on our solution, only Fij was non-zero. Okay. So this thing here is epsilon you know, I, J, K, B, I, exactly. Okay? And then there is this uh, sigma I, J here. Okay? And that here comes with a, uh, with a derivative in S. But remember, BPS equation was B, I was equal to del I, S. Okay? Now, if you look at this carefully, you don't get quite the same uh, uh, sigma matrices. Exactly, but you will get, so let's, let's, let's do that. Suppose my free index here, um, suppose I had uh, del slash here, so I will get del i, uh, sigma i del i. Gamma I, gamma I del I, gamma I del I, uh, here, 
and here I will get epsilon i j k b k uh, gamma i gamma j you know this anti-symmetric combination right, because the sigma was that anti-symmetric combination okay now uh, this guy let's write these indices properly let's call this some uh, this sum uh, m. Now let us try to take this guy and write it in terms of this gamma m. Okay? Suppose we have a spinner epsilon such that gamma 5 on epsilon equals epsilon. Okay? For such a spinner, Um, for such a spinner, we will have, where is gamma 0 coming? Somehow. Sorry. Just a What? Say, say again? Epsilon is the... Yeah, you're saying I'm mixing up uh, uh, three dimensions and four dimensions. Sorry, what? please say again. Uh, yeah, that's a good question. Uh, 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 no, let's, let's say that epsilon is the full force spinner. Um, at the moment, let's say that epsilon is a full four spinner. Um, uh, yeah, uh, just a minute. I want to show you that things that have, uh, just one sec. I'll write this. Let me take this as a, a, let's take a gamma m out into b k epsilon i j k gamma i gamma j gamma m plus del m on epsilon hmm. del m s s is here okay and now this Chi R. See, this guy, this gamma M, say, well, I'm sorry, just one second, some stupid, uh, some trivial algebra. This gamma M. See, first we know that del S M is same as B M. That's the BPS equation. Okay, so we can, l let, me, let me not do this, let me do it here. This is same as B M. Okay, now we take B M out. So we take B M and the coefficient of that has a gamma M plus an epsilon, um, m i j gamma i gamma j. I'm getting all signs wrong. Right? Okay. So, now, this guy here um, is b m gamma m times 1 plus epsilon m i j gamma i gamma j gamma m. Okay. Uh, yeah, uh, I'm, I, would, I expected chirality, just one minute. What is the 
sigma mu nu just just I'm doing something wrong with the sigma menu. What the hell is sigma menu? Sigma menu presumably is gamma menu, gamma menu, because what else could it be? Uh, gamma mu, gamma nu, I've got this gamma. Okay, so let's. Ah. Ah. I don't know what I'm doing wrong. Sorry. Mm. You see, of course, the point that there will be some spinners that obey this. But I expected to get gamma 5 here. Uh, I've got product of three matrices. Why, why not gamma fourth? If it, is, if it is sigma, then it's satisfied. Because product of sigmas can give you minus 1. Will give you minus 1. Yeah, maybe he's using this kind of notation. Maybe you're right. Maybe you're right. Let me do, I'm sorry, let me do this again. Uh, let's look at what f mu nu, the path that is non-zero is f i j, as we said. Ah, and maybe the sigma mu's are What the hell is this about? Sorry, sorry. Maybe the sigma is is uh, is self dual. Maybe it's what you're saying. Maybe self sigma. Okay, I'm sorry. I'm sorry. I'm, I'm messing up. Maybe the sigma self dual or something like that. Uh, I should have got chirality. Uh, give me one minute more. Some gamma zero.
Oh. Oh, sorry, 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 sorry. The Harvey tells us that the spinners that are preserved are preserved by our uh, are those that are that obey this on epsilon is equal to one. But that's exactly what we were getting. So let's let's say that again. So we got bi into um, epsilon i j k gamma j gamma k okay, plus gamma i on epsilon is equal to 0. Now, uh, suppose it's the case, suppose it's the case that uh, we have a, uh, a spinner such that gamma 5 times gamma 0 on epsilon is equal to gamma 5 gamma 0 epsilon, is equal to epsilon. Okay. Now, in that case, uh, using the fact that the product of all gammas is 1, this we pull out. So, this is a gamma i here, gamma i. Okay. Plus 1. Yep. Now we multiply this by gamma 5, gamma 0. Here this becomes epsilon. Okay. And here it also becomes epsilon because this whole thing, product of all 5 gammas is 1. Okay. I'm not getting any signs right. Okay. Right. So, 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 so I just had the wrong expectation. I expected that the, the spinner would be the one that was preserved by gamma 5. It's preserved by gamma 0, gamma 5. So I suppose the lesson is the very simple. You get one spinner equation here. You get a spinner equation like this, and you can solve it. Half of the spinners solve it. Okay, so you get get this this super symmetry. Sorry, sorry, Diksha, sorry for taking so long. Okay, uh, good. Any other questions or comments about this? Let's quickly we'll quickly in the next five ten minutes finish up. Okay, excellent. So, uh, uh, excellent, 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 excellent. Okay, so let's, uh, uh, let's complete our discussion. Finally, there is this question of, uh, um, uh, there is the question of the n equals 4 theory. Okay, now in the n equals 4 theory, we know that we have states with, we know that we have states with, let's say, N, E, N, M. Let's use Harvey's notation. So let's say we go to the n equals 4 theory and we go on the Coulomb branch and we label states with the electric charges n, e, and n, m. Okay. So we know that we have states with, with charges 1, 0, for instance. These are the W bosons. We also know that we have st states with charges 0, 1. Those are the, um, uh, those are the monopoles. Okay. Now, because if we have S duality, we have the full SL2Z duality, as we've argued before, because tau goes to minus 1 by tau, comes is the non-trivial conjecture of S duality, and tau goes to tau plus 1 is automatic, that's from this, the periodicity of theta, and together they generate the full SL2Z circle. Okay? So if we have this, then we can act on this charge, and there are no walls of marginal stability. As you... you at any value of the coupling, if you've got some charge, your state, you've got that state at all values of the coupling. You know, this is what's different from Cyberg-Witten theory. Right? We have these models of marginal stability. 
Okay, so if at any value of the coupling you've got some st some state, you've got the you've got that state at all values of the coupling, then we can predict the full spectrum of st at least predict a minimum set of spec of charges for this thing, because we can act with S L two Z, A B C D, on let's say one zero. Same as acting with S L two Z on zero one because. SL2 Z, that is an SL2 Z element that takes 1, 0 to 0, and empty tau goes to minus 1 beta. Okay, well, these guys belong to SL2 Z. Okay, so let's see what charges we get. We get, uh, by, by doing this, we get A here and uh, C here. But remember that AD minus BC was equal to 1. That was the determinant condition. Okay? So if you have two numbers such that AD minus BC is equal to 1, that means there's a multiple of A minus a multiple of C whose difference is 1. Okay? Now, if A and C are any non-trivial numbers, numbers with not both 1, okay, this means they're relatively prime. Okay, therefore we get this prediction. We get the prediction that there is in the BPS spectrum, BPS states with charges A, C, where A and C are any relatively prime numbers. Okay, now in particular, let us take the case C equals 2. Therefore, there should be a BPS state with charge A2 where A is any odd number. Okay. This is a non-trivial prediction of this duality and is either true or not. Now, how do we check whether it's true or not? You might have thought that we have to find dionic solutions of, these th uh, the, uh, of this theory. That would be a very, very difficult job. Uh, Ashok's uh, insight was that this collective coordinate method that we used for uh, uh, that we used for the one monopole sector, we can also use for the two monopole sector. Okay, just as before, if in the weak coupling limit, rely the, the collective coordinate method is reliable. Okay, so if this bound state exists. It also exists in the quantum mechanics on the moduli space of two monopoles. Okay, so we should be able to see that there are uh, states in the moduli uh, on the uh, by quantizing the moduli, moduli space of two monopoles. Okay, uh, that have every odd charge. There should be exactly one such state for every odd charge. The point about this is that now it's turned into a computable problem. Okay, quantum mechanics and monopole moduli space some quantum mechanics. Existence of these bounds, these, these states with these, uh, so these supersymmetric properties is some property in, this, in, this, in the supersymmetric one. Okay, now maybe at the beginning of the next lecture I will go through the technical details. It's got late now, but let me just tell you how it's going to go. I don't know if you remember, but we started our course with, by discussing supersymmetric quantum mechanics. And... One of the things we discovered was that supersymmetric states and supersymmetric quantum mechanics were very beautiful. Okay? They were harmonic forms. Okay? When we had supersymmetric quantum mechanics, we had these harmonic forms. And those gave us supersymmetric states. So, the question about existence or otherwise of these bound states translates into a very definite mathematical question about, quant about geometry. The geometry in question is the, is, the met is the space which captures two monopole moduli space. Okay, This space is this tau natatiya whatever space uh, which we will describe in detail next class. Okay, And um, uh, the question that we want to ask is, do, do there exist um, harmonic forms on the space? Now, this space 
is going to be a non-compact space, right? It's going to have motions of the two monopoles going far away from each other. And if you've got a state which has its support on this non-compact direction, that's not a bound state. So the question really becomes, do there exist normalizable okay, harmonic forms on this, uh, 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 on this space? Okay. And uh, Ashok in his extremely simple paper wrote down the metric, wrote down an ansatz and found such normalizable forms. <laughs> yes, they do. <laughs> okay. So that's all, that, that, that is all that's left. It is just a simple explicit computation. Uh, the insight, of course, was not in doing the computation. Insight was realizing this is the computation that can be computationally done. You know, you have the ability to do this. Okay. Yeah. So that, that, that's all that's left in our discussion for, of these n equals 4 theories and duality. I'll present the technical details next class. Now, next Friday, I will be in ICTS, so I won't be taking class. Uh, we'll have class again on Tuesday.